Good morning to everyone. <clears throat> right now, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bruce Stromberg, who is one of the SPIE invited lecturers. And he holds the position of, as the director of the Beckman Laser Institute and Medical Clinic at the University of California in Irvine. He is a professor of biomedical engineering and surgery and the former editor-in-chief of the Journal of Biomedical Optics. And his research interests are in photodiagnosis, such as the application and development of optical imaging and spectroscopy methods for non-invasive monitoring and imaging of physiological, physiological processes in tissues and cells. And for this reason, he has received several awards. So welcome, Dr. Tromberg. Uh, thank you to be here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for the invitation. Thanks to the organizing committee. Thanks to SPIE for sponsoring our trip and helping sponsor the conference. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is my first time in Brazil, so it's really exciting. And it's also my first time wearing one of these, so it's a little strange. But uh, I guess I'll get through it. I feel like, um, oh, who's that guy? Tony, Tony Robbins, that inspirational speaker, you know, who talks about... I'll try to inspire you on functional imaging. Um, so, okay, so let me, let me first give you a, a very brief outline of what I'll, I'll talk about. In, this is over the course of three lectures, so uh, we won't go through all of this uh, this morning. But the first one is spectroscopy and tissue optics, and this will be kind of a fundamental lecture. Uh, where does contrast come from? What is absorption? What is scattering in tissue? Uh, how we control optical path length? why I think that that's so important, and hopefully I'll convince you that that's all very important. And we'll talk about this uh, conceptual framework, mathematical framework, that allows us to make measurements called photon density waves. And uh, then the second lecture will be on measurement technologies, and the third will be on applications. Uh, sort of, so if you can make it through the first one, uh, I promise that there will be good ones to follow with really interesting physiology and medicine coming. So there are five Beckman Institutes in the U.S., just to give you a little orientation as to where I'm coming from. Um, I'm in Irvine. Uh, this was the first one. It was actually started in 1982. Uh, the building opened in 1986. So we've been doing lasers and optics in biology and medicine for many years. Uh, the institute was established by Mike Burns and Arnold Beckman. It was built with a clinic and uh, basic research and technology development labs. The clinic has an operating room. We see about 4,000 patients a year. And we make new technologies and bring them into the clinic. So we have about six or 700 patients that we enroll on clinical protocols, all using these optical technologies. So it's a very interesting setting. And um, I understand you just, you don't even have biology here. So, uh, but maybe you could build a clinic and start to do some laser medicine. Clinical office in physics. I think physicists are much better at clinical work anyway. So <laughs> Brian and I were talking about this last night. Um, and the institute, it's a true institute, just like you have an institute. Um, it's uh, multidisciplinary. We have faculty, over 20 faculty from different schools, departments, students from many different departments, computer science, biology. The only thing everybody has in common is they believe light is important, and they, they like photons and lasers. So let's talk about medical imaging. I'm trying to really give a lecture on functional imaging. And when you think about functional imaging, um, if you are in medicine, uh, one of the last things you think about is optics. So the first thing you're thinking about is functional MRI or PET imaging. So the mainstream imaging mod modalities are MR, X-ray, nuclear, ultrasound. And optics is kind of parenthetically off to the side. Uh, in some sense, that's because optics is everywhere, so endoscopy uses optics. Physicians f will literally will exam examine patients with their eyes and look at optical properties. But as a, as a mainstream radiologic method, it's really off on the side. But there, of course, is a fair amount of optics that's standard of care. Um, and if you've certainly, I think all of you have been following optical coherence tomography, that's a spectacular technologic innovation that's completely transformed how people do ophthalmology. So this is now standard of care. 
It took about 15 years from the, the first description of the technology uh, to when it was integrated into commercial systems and then became widely available in, in doctors' offices. So this is a rapidly growing area and there are many innovations that continue to drive it. And standard of care now is the ability with OCT to actually image all of the layers of the retina. And with continuing technologic innovation, new instruments are being developed that allow you to image both the front of the eye and the back of the eye all at the same time with this very, very high resolution. So this is an exciting development. Endoscop endoscopic techniques, of course, are widely used and there are many advances in endoscopy that are coming from the optics community. And in terms of bedside monitoring, portable point of care devices, I think all of you are familiar with oximetry instruments. Pulse oximetry looks at the arterial saturation. Uh, this company, Massimo and others, uh, are involved in the development of non-invasive hemoglobin diagnostics. So instead of taking blood out of the body, this bedside device can measure hemoglobin concentration non-invasively through the skin inside the body. And that's clearly the trend. So what I want to emphasize and what may also be important for Brazil and other emerging economies is the ability to bring technology to the patient wherever that patient is. So optical methods intrinsically are point of care or can be. And there are low barriers to access once you make these small portable devices. They're not controlled by a few people in the United States, for example. The radiology community is the controlling community for MRI and PET, CT. You have to ask a radiologist to do an image. You have to ask a radiologist to interpret the image. Uh, and this is how they kind of conserve their power over all of these techniques. But with the transformation of technologies moving into the hands of people, everyone actually can begin to control diagnostic methods. So how many of you all have smartphones? Okay, at least that's a pretty good representation. And how many have apps on, smart, on your smartphone that measures your pulse or your respiration? Anybody have one that measures blood pressure? Because I'm still looking for that. <laughs> You still have to measure your pressure and then it will be uploaded into your app. But there, you can even get an EKG for your smartphone, a little attachment that adds on, and you can actually measure EKG very beautifully. So there are a lot of apps that are being developed. One of my colleagues developed a, a really fantastic app, Brian Wong, uh, for testing your hearing and also for amplifying where your hearing loss is. So potentially, taking expensive hearing aids out of the hands of that industry and putting it into your pocket. So there are lots of things that are happening. They're very exciting. And uh, I'll try to talk about the basis of the technologies that can go into these, and then you can design your own. So <coughs> in terms of what, the new what are the goals for the new technologies? Where is medical optics going? Where would we like it to be? So first of all, we want to see beneath the surface. So traditionally, what the reason why radiologists think that optics doesn't work or is not useful in diagnostics, in mainstream diagnostics, is because they think of optics as a way of seeing the surface. They think of it as a camera. And of course, in endoscopy, that's what they use. They use cameras. However, new techniques, and if you think of OCT or confocal, they see beneath the surface. So we want to push these methods as far as they can to see as deep as we can. And we also want to understand what are the biologic origins of contrast. It's really, no, it's not a good technology if there's no contrast. So imaging, people argue about resolution, they talk about contrast, but it's kind of like the argument in soccer, do you, should you have a good offense or should you have a good defense? If you don't have contrast, there's no point in even discussing resolution. So we need to understand where the contrast comes from. And then finally, this is perhaps the most difficult thing to do. Brian is, has pioneered this area and has inspired lots of us to continue along this line, but it's incredibly difficult to do. And that's to link some sort of optical measurement to a clinical outcome. And I really encourage all of you to start thinking about that in your work if you want to do clinical translation. So what is the roadmap for our field? This is just the big picture view of what's going on in imaging. Uh, on the y-axis, we have resolution. 
on the x-axis we have depth, and clearly you're giving up resolution as you go deeper and deeper into the tissue. So the first thing to recognize is that these blue technologies, nanoscopic imaging, microscopic techniques, coherence tomographies, they all, the, the goal of all these methods is to form high resolution images using the coherent properties of light. So they're trying to suppress multiply scattered photons and develop strategies to gate them out. So in microscopy, some of those gating strategies are geometric. You can use a pinhole to block out scattered photons and just form information from coherent reflectance or, co or, or fluorescence that's coherently excited. Well, not exactly coherently excited, but it's excited. And then we use this geometrical gate to suppress any extraneous information content. Uh, we can also use electronic gating, as in nonlinear microscopy, where we have maybe multi-photon excitation of fluorescence or harmonic generation that comes from non-centrosymmetric structures like collagen in the body. We can also do nonlinear Raman by mixing multiple wavelengths together and generating a coherent Raman signal. So these are all very beautiful gating strategies that allow us to localize the information in a fraction of a femtoliter inside of a laser beam that's scanning through a cell or through a tissue. Also in coherence tomographies, uh, as I mentioned before, optical coherence tomography, OCT, that uses interferometric gating to suppress information from multiply scattered photons. So all of these blue coded techniques are using coherent information. Then we move over to the red techniques, photoacoustic tomographies, macroscopic imaging, diffuse tomography. Um, they're capable of penetrating or, or forming in images or generating information much more deeply in tissue. So these coherent methods run out of coherent information content, typically at about a few hundred microns or a millimeter or so. One millimeter is something of the, the magic number, and I'll come back to this. This is what we call the transport scattering length in tissue. That's the distance over which light is more or less isotropically distributed. So then we can use these techniques that treat light as particles or photons as particles. We can model them stochastically. Optical phase information is no longer important. It's entirely random. And these are the methods that I will talk about. But what's important to, to really think about here is that the contrast that we get from these macroscopic or diffuse methods is fundamentally coming from those interactions between light and cells and extracellular matrix that is communicated by these coherent imaging methods. And that's why you'll see many laboratories in our field working simultaneously on coherent imaging as well as multiply scattered light imaging. So I said I'm going to talk about diffuse optics, and this is uh, to bring everybody back to reality and wake everyone up. So this is a really a literally a personal view of diffuse optics. So this is me, um, and I have uh, in my mouth a few 850 nanometer LEDs. I'm literally sucking on them, biting down on these LEDs. And uh, then I'm, the picture is being taken by a consumer camera. It's a Canon Rebel. But very importantly, the IR blocking filter has been removed. It still has the Bayer filters on it, so it's an RGB camera, but the IR blocking filter is off. The exposure time is only a few hundred milliseconds, so it's actually very short, so this is not a difficult or expensive experiment to do. Um, and so there's no outside illumination. There, this is taken completely in the dark. And what you can see is that there's a huge amount of light that propagates through the tissue. It's going through hard tissue, soft tissue. It's going several centimeters. And this is entirely from near-infrared, multiply scattered light. Now, I've blocked off the source here, and so you have absolutely no idea where the light came from. It may have come from, you know, the back of my head, or uh, it's, it could, could have come from anywhere. It's entirely randomized. So this is both the very beautiful image of our field and the really horrible image of our field. So it tells us that there is a lot of light that's available for doing something, but it doesn't tell us what we can do with it yet. And that's what we'll be talking about. What is the information content and how do we tell where the light has been? 
So the first thing that we have to do is really understand, so that's all, those are all multiply scattered photons. So I want to take you through a little bit of fundamentals about where does scattering come from in tissue? What is the origin of light scattering? So some of you may be familiar with this, others, this may be new. So for those of you who know about it, you can go on the internet now and do something else. So first, sources of scattering in tissue are really fundamentally a consequence of refractive index mismatches. Those mismatches are, or discontinuities are between materials like lipid and water or protein and water, protein and lipid. And we find them in cell membranes or folds of membranes, membrane of structures, dense protein containing structures like uh, uh, in the nucleus. We also have very strong scattering from intracellular organelles uh, that are known as mitochondria. Uh, which have very, very interesting features. In addition to scattering properties, they have endogenous fluorophores and absorbers in them that tell us about the energetics of cells. We also have, in the extracellular matrix, we have collagen fibers that scatter light very strongly. These are on the order of two to three microns in dimension. And these are formed by fibrils, uh, which also scatter light. And there are pentad repeats of fibers this periodic uh, structure actually has a, a unique scattering signature as well. And then we also see in cells there are nuclei in particular in, particular in different phases of the cell or in cancer cells uh, there may be an extraordinary amount of light scattering that comes from these structures. And then if we now take a bigger view of light propagation in tissue and let's take our physics model of what tissue is. Um, so these big structures represent scattering. These smaller dots represent absorption loss. When light goes in, it's scattered multiply, changes direction. And so I, I just want to now calibrate everybody on the measurement units, the terminology. So we talk about an absorption coefficient, mu sub a, which is the reciprocal of the absorption length. The absorption length is quite literally the average distance between absorption events. And in the near infrared in tissue, this is surprising. Does anybody know what the absorption length is? This is your test, again, to see if you're awake. Take a guess. All right, let me give you some answers, then you, you pick. Is it one centimeter, 10 centimeters, or 100 centimeters? How many vote for 100 centimeters? How many vote for 10? How many vote for one? Okay, that's pretty good. It's 10 centimeters. It's extremely long. So that means absorption is very, very unlikely. If I take 10 centimeters and I divide that by the velocity of light, that's the average time between absorption events, and that's actually pretty long. It's about a half a nanosecond, but we'll come back to that in a, sec in a few minutes. So if I want to go from mu sub a, the linear absorption co coefficient, to the concentration of my absorber, all I have to do is know the molar extinction coefficient and multiply by a logarithmic factor. So if I can measure that mu sub a, I can determine concentration. Now let's talk about scattering. We have the same type of terminology. We have mu sub s. Mu sub s is the scattering coefficient. The reciprocal of that is the scattering length. So that's the average distance between the scattering events. Now, in tissues, let's take a guess. Do I have the answer up there? No? So what, what uh, does anybody know what the scattering length in tissues might be in near-infrared? OK, I'll give you some numbers. Uh, one micron, or let's say two microns, 20 microns, 200 microns. How many say 200? You're, you're always going for the big numbers. I like that. <laughs> Uh, how many say 20? Okay. And how many say 2? Well, this, good. So 20 is the most popular, and 20 wins. Um, so it's about 20 to 40 microns is the, are the scattering lengths. And then uh, again, if you take the reciprocal of that, that's, that relates to the time, and that's fractions of picoseconds. Now, we, if we multiply the mu sub s times an anisotropy factor, which we'll talk about in just a second, we get the reduced or the effective scattering coefficient, mu sub s prime. And if we take the reciprocal of the mu sub s prime, we get the transport scattering length. And remember the first, that early roadmap I showed you, 
where we had coherent techniques and diffuse techniques, and there was kind of this inflection point of one millimeter. That's how we get the one millimeter. That's the transport scattering length. It's literally the reciprocal of the mu sub s prime. OK, so we're all calibrated now on that picture. Now, it's important that there's a wavelength dependence of light propagation in tissue. And if you have scattering particles that are very small with respect to the optical wavelength, then the scattering falls off as approximately 1 over lambda to the 4. So those are for small scattering par particles, and, and, and you know that to be Rayleigh scattering. As the particles get larger with respect to the optical wavelength, then the, the intensity of the light scattering falls off as 1 over lambda. So that's a ver another important ingredient that we have to think about as we're developing techniques for probing deeper tissue structures. And there's a geometrical dependence to this. So Rayleigh scattering is more or less isotropic, whereas Mie scattering with larger particles is highly directional. And that directionality can be explained in terms of the anisotropy. So if we have an incident photon coming from here, then the average scattering angle is what we refer to as a component of the anisotropy. So the G, the anisotropy, is literally equal to the average cosine of that scattering angle. If it's G is minus 1, then everything is going backwards. If G is 1, then all of the scattering goes forward. And for most biologic tissues, G ranges between about 0.7 and 0.9. Uh, red blood cells are kind of an exception. Uh, the G is 0.98. It's very, very forward directed. Uh, the average scattering angles are only 10 or 12 degrees. And then this is why we talk about mu sub s prime. It's because of these anisotropy effects. So if you think of light coming in and every scattering event, so these, this is a scattering length, which is 20 to 40 microns. There's some mean angular displacement of that event. And after a certain number of scattering events, then we have the mean displacement or the transport scattering length. And so this is entirely analogous to the description of molecular diffusion that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, and this is a convenient way of representing the fact that light becomes more or less isotropic at those distances. So now let's get back to this wavelength dependence issue. So we talked about Rayleigh scattering and Mie scattering. And here's kind of the big picture of the visible to near infrared. And what we see, and this is a bit of an exaggeration, but we see that the scattering behavior falls off as 1 over lambda to the 4 at shorter wavelengths and then begins to flatten as we go to longer wavelengths at 1 over lambda. And these are the major absorbers in tissue. There's melanin, which has very high absorption but doesn't really have any structural features. And then there are structural features that come from hemoglobin. So we see that between 6 and 700 nanometers, hemoglobin absorption is falling off almost by two orders of magnitude. At the same time, scattering is leveling off. It's not dropping so fast. So in the visible, what we have is a situation where the scattering and absorption are about equal to each other. And as we move into the near infrared, the scattering far outweighs the absorption. And because of this, light propagation is dominated by multiple scattering. So because of this difference, the absorption lengths are very, very long. And the scattering lengths are much shorter. And therefore, we're able to get a lot of light into tissue before it's sucked up or lost by an absorber. So this brings us to the near infrared, where here's that picture of me again. And then let's take a magnified view of the near infrared. What is the information content in the near infrared? Well, I think most of you are familiar with the differential absorption features between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So these are very beautiful and well resolved. There's an isosbestic point at about 800 nanometers. So blue of 800, we have light absorption dominated by deoxyhemoglobin. Red of this, it's oxyhemoglobin. And then we have two other features that we're very interested in. At about 920, there's a very strong lipid absorption. And at about 980, there's a very strong water absorption. Now, those are not electronic states. So the hemoglobin absorption features are actually electronic states. These 920 and 980 features are harmonics of infrared vibrations. So for lipid, it comes from a CH stretch. 
for water, it comes from an OH. So these are harmonics. They are recombinations. And therefore, the, the peaks can move around a little bit. They can also broaden, depending upon what those molecules are associated with inside the tissue. So if they're bound or associated with other macromolecules, then those features can change. And that provides a lot of useful diagnostic information. N about 80% or 90% of absorption in the near infrared is accounted for simply by those four components. Now, if you have a photosensitizer and it has a feature out there, or an exogenous fluorescent dye and it has a feature there, then you can also measure its concentration. But you need to account for the intrinsic absorption of all those components. So this really gets us to the main challenge. If you're just doing experiments in cuvettes, and for those of us who try to take our technologies and translate them into the clinic, uh, it's actually a little crazy, and Brian and, and I were complaining to each other last night that maybe we should just go back to the cuvette because it's a lot easier, no IRBs, no physicians, no, it's just more simple. You can control these experiments. But if we're going to venture into the body and try to take these measurements into the clinic, then this, is something this image is something worth keeping in your head. We would like the body to essentially be this cuvette. We want to be just like the chemistry and physics labs that have beautiful lasers and fantastic instruments, and then you know they have some incredibly elaborate cuvette system where they have one molecule that they're looking at in the gas phase. We want the technology, but we get rid of that, and we just shine the light into the body and we want to interpret that information. So if we have that elaborate system where we just have one molecule and everything is pure, no other interactions, then we can measure the attenuation of the light and relate that directly to the concentration of whatever is inside through the absorption coefficient, the molar extinction coefficient, and B, the path length. We know the path length in a cuvette in a spectrophotometer is one centimeter. So that's sort of the typical standard path length. If we go into the body, if we just shoot those lasers into people, then light gets scattered randomly. It moves in all different directions. And if we have a detector on the other side, we can't say exactly what the concentration is because losses are coming from both absorption and scattering. So again, we have our same relation, the Beer's Law. The absorption coefficient is equal to an extinction coefficient times the path length times the concentration but the path length is unknown here. And that's really the focus of this lecture and the work uh, that, that we do in tissue optics. So why do we want to measure the path length? What's the benefit to this? From a physics point of view, this will allow us to separate light absorption from light scattering, quantify each of these independently, and potentially then uh, do tomography or localize this information in 3D. From a physiologic point of view, we can translate these physical measurements into an ability to determine perfusion and metabolism at depth. So when I say perfusion and metabolism, they're really surrogates for, for oxyheme, total hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin. And we can determine the concentration of other near-infrared absorbers and fluorophores, so for example, water and lipid and any exogenous dyes or particles that have a signature out in that region. And finally, and this is important, and, and many people really forget to do this, but fluorescence can be a very beautiful signal, but it can also be distorted by the intrinsic tissue optical properties. So if you know what those properties are, then you can correct the fluorescence for those intrinsic properties. And so let me just show you what I mean by that. So if this, for example, theoretically is our pure fluorophore inside of a cuvette, it will have a spectrum that when you measure it in the tissue that may be corrupted or distorted by the absorption which can reabsorb the emitted photons and the scattering. These are all wavelength dependent phenomena. So if I know what those properties are, then I can fix that signal. I can recover information content that was lost or distorted. And I can account for what those properties are doing to my fluorescence. So let's talk about the ways to control path length. There are three basic ways to control optical path length in tissue. The first one, as you might guess, when I talked about the wavelength dependent of light propagation, 
is to control the optical wavelength. And in fact, this is really the most powerful way to control optical path length in tissue. Where absorption and scattering lengths are about equal in the visible region, the path length doesn't vary that much. But then as we start to go into the region of multiple light scattering, and absorption lengths are much, much greater than scattering lengths, the path length can increase by 15 or 20 fold. So there's a huge change in optical path length. And, and this is really, this is nicely illustrated by this transillumination picture of a rabbit ear with a tumor implanted. And you see in the blue, you see nice contrast and in the green between vessels and the surrounding tissue. In the red, you lose all of that contrast. Light is propagating all the way through this tissue. The only dark attenuation that you see is right in the center of this very thick absorbing tumor. Now, even in the near infrared, where path length may be 20-fold different from the visible, there can be changes in path length due to dynamic physiology. What do I mean by dynamic physiology? So if cells are actually functioning and taking up oxygen, maybe they're under stress or being perturbed by some event, a drug or an occlusion or a disease, then the saturation will change. Saturation is the ratio of oxygenated hemoglobin to total hemoglobin. So even in this region, in the near infrared, if we go from 50% saturation to 100%, the path length can change by another factor of two or so. So under conditions of dynamic physiology, path length can fluctuate. And just as a way of illustrating that, um, and helping you remember that concept, so this is another picture of me. Uh, this is not taken with the light inside. This is actually taken with the light outside. And I look very differently under these two illumination conditions. So this is 400 nanometer light, where absorption and scattering are about equal. This is 850 nanometer light, where the absorption lengths are much greater than the scattering lengths. So why is there all of this contrast here? What is that contrast coming from? Any, any guesses? All you have to do is say the name of one thing. What is it? Scattering? No. <laughs> what did? Somebody said something. Did anybody say melanin? Did you say melanin? Excellent. Okay. So you made up for your wrong answers before, and you got this one right. <laughs> so this is all coming from melanin, because melanin is residing about 150, 120, 150 microns beneath the surface of the tissue. It's localized in melanosomes that are taken up by keratinocytes or melanocytes that are producing the melanosomes. But it's really, it's fundamentally deposited in a thin layer in the skin. And so this light does not penetrate very deeply. It's absorbed very strongly by melanin. And you see all the melanin that normally you don't see with your eyes. All of this melanin in me is actually, this is a, an, an interesting story. So we've been looking at the differences between pheomelanin and eumelanin. Most of all of you have eumelanin. I have a lot of pheomelanin. They have some different absorption features and different risks for developing melanoma. So we're particularly interested in this. Now, I can suddenly look better, and this is the, the secret of cosmetics. I can look much, much better when I'm illuminated with near-infrared light, 850 nanometer light, and this is because this is penetrating more deeply and it's scattering multiply, so it softens out the appearance. So if you could put something on top of your skin, for example, that causes multiple light scattering, you could approximate this look, but of course, you can't get as good as being illuminated by near-infrared light. That's the best. So if somehow the cosmetics companies can figure out how to get everybody to be visible in the near-infrared, then they would solve all of their problems. But that's the beauty of this. Light is penetrating more deeply into the tissue, and that is the multiple light scattering effect that you're seeing, so you don't see the attenuation loss by the melanin. The second major way to control path length is in space. 
So this is kind of a physics lecture. So you know, we went from wavelength to space, and then you can guess what the next one will be. There's only one more dimension that's available to us. So in space, the absorption lengths, as I mentioned before, are about 10 centimeters. The scattering lengths are 20 to 40 microns. So if we take our light source and measure at some distance away from the source, in multiple distances, so literally we can take a fiber, put it on the tissue, and have multiple fibers, and look as a function of source detector separation. We see that very close to the source, that the decay of the information is dominated by light scattering, and further from the source, it's a combination of scattering and absorption. And if we take this entire behavior, and we fit it to a model that predicts this decay behavior, a diffusion model, or a model for light transport, then we can calculate the absorption and the scattering by this nonlinear behavior as the light decays from the source. And actually, this is one of the things that kind of inspired me to get into the field. Brian Wilson and his colleagues had developed this in the early 90s um, to describe tissue optical properties. And this was, for me, really intriguing to see this decay and it's a very powerful way of measuring tissue optical properties with contact fibers that you can place in any location on the tissue. Now the third major way to control path length is in time. So if you take those lengths and divide it by the velocity of light, then you have the average time between these events. So the absorption times are about a half a nanosecond. The scattering times are a fraction of a picosecond. Now both of those sound very fast but they're actually, the absorption times are pretty slow in comparison to the scattering relaxation times. So if we take a pulse of light, let's say a picosecond pulse, and we put it in a tissue, then it will actually spread out in time. And that time dispersion, the temporal dispersion, is a consequence of the multiple paths that the light can take as it propagates through the tissue. So you take that picosecond pulse, it's carrying photons, they go into the tissue. Some of them will propagate very far and take longer times to come out. They're all traveling at the speed limit, which is the velocity of light. So nobody's exceeding that, not in these experiments. And then if you have light that travels very short distances, they come out sooner. So here in the early emerging photons, they're dominated by scattering, and the longer path photons are dominated by absorption. And this kind of graphically illustrates that you can separate this information also in space. So you can roughly characterize these early emerging photons as ones that are more superficial in propagation. And the deeper penetrating photons, the later arriving photons, uh, are penetrating more deeply on average. So let's kind of do a summary of where we are. We have techniques that are both time resolved and spatially resolved in what we call the real domain. So we put, in terms of time resolved techniques, a pulse of light on the order of picoseconds, and it will spread out in time. And spatially resolved techniques, we'll put a point of light in, and we'll look at how it spreads out in space. And we know that mathematically, the real domain and the frequency domain are related to each other through a Fourier transform. So if we then take this concept, and rather than using a pulse of light, which contains all frequencies, if we modulate light in time at a specific frequency, then we can watch how that frequency it undergoes dispersion as it propagates through the tissue. And in fact, as we change frequencies, there's a frequency-dependent propagation. Now, if I changed and, and, and I, I launched essentially all possible frequencies, I would have the equivalent of a pulse of light. But I can do effectively a monochromatic experiment by intensity modulating in time at a single frequency or 10 frequencies or 100 frequencies. And I can be very selective and then measure that frequency dependent dispersion of the light propagation. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now, I can do the same thing in the spatial domain. So if I intensity modulate light rather than in time, I intensity modulate it in space, then I can look and see how these patterns of light, because when I say intensity modulate in space, that's a physics-y way of saying a pattern. So I can put a pattern of light onto tissue, 
and watch how that pattern blurs. And, and the power of this is that now I can use a camera to image the blurring of the pattern. And if I measure this very precisely as I change these frequencies, then I can calculate the optical properties of my tissue in every region that I look at with my camera. So let's take a, a look in just a little bit more detail at the experiments. In the temporal frequency domain, we modulate light in time. We typically use a diode laser, and we mix the RF and DC. So DC allows us to turn the laser on, and then we hit it with RF that allows us to oscillate it in time. And this results in the propagation of what we call diffuse photon density waves. Now these are scalar waves that maintain that modulation characteristic. They propagate through the medium at a characteristic phase velocity, which is much less than the velocity of light, and it's a consequence of the optical properties of the medium. So literally, the scattering will slow down the phase velocity, and it will actually slow it to a tenth or even a hundredth of the velocity of light. Now, the photons in those scalar waves are all moving at the velocity of light. So it's not unlike, let's say, an ocean wave that comes to the shore, and it's influenced by whether it's a sandy bottom or a coral reef. Surfers call these breaks. So beach breaks or point breaks or reef breaks, all of these things that actually my kids are really into. So it's helped me understand the physics Surfing has helped me understand the physics of scalar photon density waves. So, any of you surf? Brazil is a big place for surfing. I guess not here in the middle of the country, but yeah. So, the phase velocity will change, and if we measure the amplitude and the phase as a function of frequency and compare that to a theoretical response, and we have some sort of theoretical response, which I'll describe in a minute, then we can calculate the absorption coefficient and scattering coefficient as a function of optical wavelength. In the spatial frequency domain, we can do the same experiment. But instead of taking RF and DC and mixing it into a little bias T or a circuit, what we can do is use a digital light projector or any spatial light modulator. And here, we can turn the light, we can change the colors of the light by either putting a, a filter in front of a camera or putting a filter in front of our projector. And we put, project these patterns of light onto the tissue, and we can describe them mathematically. And in order to actually do this experiment properly, we need to shift the patterns in phase. So we typically will project three different phases at a given frequency. And then we can demodulate the reflected light information content. So if there's some absorber beneath the surface, then we can accurately characterize that absorber by demodulating, and this is the demodulation expression, which, which actually is the same that's used if you're familiar with structured light microscopy. And any, it's just a standard demodulation approach. So this allows us to accurately measure the envelope of this function and see the attenuation and quantify that attenuation. Now, we have to... These are all model-based techniques, and I won't get into a lot of details about the models. There's a lot written about these, but I'll give you some directions about where you can go to. So typically, what we do is we use a diffusion approximation to light transport. So this diffusion approximation, the origins of it are in the Boltzmann transport equation. But that's not solvable. That equation is not solvable. So we use this approximation. And here are the sort of the big terms. We have a source term. And we have a term that describes the fluence rate in space and time. We have a buildup or a light scattering term. And we have a, mu a term that's got mu sub a or a loss in it. And then here is the diffusion coefficient, the d. You see how that appears. So this is just like molecular diffusion. It's just that the time scale of these events is several <laughs> orders of magnitude faster. And you can solve this equation in the frequency domain. If you describe light in terms of temporal modulation or um, uh, having an AC and a DC component, and in infinite media, we can express the AC form of this in terms of K, a complex wave number, which has both real and imaginary components. So this is a very convenient way to express 
scalar photon density waves. And I've just expressed this in time, but you can express it in space as well. And when you, when you characterize it in terms of this complex wave number with real and imaginary components, it gives you a powerful way of taking data and actually fitting your data to this model and then determining, calculating, the free parameters in the model, which are the absorption and the scattering. So let me try to summarize where we are. Um, we are talking about diffuse optics technologies, and in the frequency domain, we're taking advantage of this conceptual framework called scalar photon density waves. These are waves that propagate in the medium with a much longer wavelength than the optical wavelength. So these are wavelengths that are, that, that are the structure is imposed by the temporal modulation or the spatial modulation. And if we use temporally modulated sources, we typically are launching the information onto fibers and put fibers onto the tissue. Generally, our source detector separations with our fibers are several centimeters. So we're probing several centimeters beneath the tissue. In fact, we can go up to about 10 centimeters of depth if we take a source and put a detector on the other side. And there are many groups that are doing this, let's say, with translumination in breast cancer. So you can go all the way through breast tissue with light in the near-infrared. And if you think of that picture of me with the LEDs in my mouth, you know, that can help convince you that near-infrared light is propagating over several centimeters in tissue. If we use spatial modulation, this is a way of doing non-contact imaging. So I can modulate patterns or project patterns of light onto tissue just with my digital light projectors. I can use a camera, and if I have a clever enough model, then I can calculate the absorption and the scattering in every pixel in my field of view. Here, because it's planar illumination, the sensitivity map is very different from when you have contact probes. So our mean penetration is on the order of a few millimeters in tissue. Depending upon the optical wavelength and the type of tissue, we may be limited to primarily imaging skin or subcutaneous tissue, so several millimeters, but theoretically up to about a centimeter of perturbations we can see. But it's not the same as this. Now, people have used transillumination geometries using spatial modulation as well. And there are groups that are doing this for small animal imaging. So you can image a few centimeters in a transillumination geometry. Now, they also have different resolution capabilities. So generally, with these temporally modulated waves, resolution is on the order of several millimeters to a centimeter. With spatially modulated waves, uh, we can, in reflectance geometry, resolve structures or features that are on the order of a millimeter. And in some cases, uh, I'll show in my next lecture, even, even better resolution than a millimeter. So I think we hold the world's record for the highest resolution DOT, diffuse optical tomography, of less than a millimeter. So that, that's my last slide. Um, and this, I just want to advertise, uh-oh, that's not a hyperlink. Um, I want to see if I'm connected to the internet. Yeah. So if you're interested in these kinds of tissue optics uh, types of things, we have on our website um, access to virtual photonics uh, tools, which allow you to manipulate light propagation, both forward and inverse solvers, using Monte Carlo techniques and diffusion models. So I encourage you to explore this. So there are different panels that there's a GUI interface um, that allow you to, to visualize light propagation in different ways and, and actually export that data, import data. Um, so it can be a very powerful approach. So just as an example, um, here is the forward solver engine. Uh, you can use various different uh, representations for forward solvers. Um, we have inverse solvers, Monte Carlo. We have a spectral approach. And you can look at your solution in steady state, time domain, or frequency domain. Uh, here, I'm just going to give you an example of how you can look at R, the reflectance, as a function of source detector separation. Um, and so you can put in your parameters, you put in your optical properties, and we'll generate 
affluence map. So <coughs> that's what light prop it. You see many people will show sometimes in their talks where does the light go when it's launched into tissue. This is a simulation that shows the mean penetration depth uh, for these given optical properties. Um, and you can see where the light is as a cross-sectional view in the tissue. And we can solve this for different types of sources. Uh, and there are a variety of different options for this. Um, if we look at the spectral panel, for example, and we want to look at the spectral features of different tissues. There's skin, and this is based on literature values. And this is all well documented, so you can take a look at and see what these properties are. I can compare skin, for example, to, let's say, white matter or gray matter in brain. I think I hit the wrong button. There we go. So there's skin and brain. And you can experiment with these things and see there's a lot of, lot of power to these approaches. OK, with that, thank you very much. Thanks for the nice presentation. Thank you. you I don't know if I'm right, but you s used the Lorentz the mid device approximation to solve the, the, the scattering. Uh, but you can calculate what is the percentage of the ray light scattering and my scattering, or, uh, or not? So generally what's done in our field is some people are bold enough to try to go back to sort of first principles and use me theory and try to extract the density of the scatterers and the mean particle size. But that's very, very difficult to do. So what most people just do is they sort of constrain the wavelength dependence of scattering to fall off as approximately one over lambda. So most people, if they measure scattering in tissue, then they'll fit the wavelength be dependent behavior to some scattering prefactor A, lambda, to the minus B. And they just fit for the A and B parameters, the amplitude and the wavelength dependence, and just derive that. Now, some people are bold enough to try to take the A and B parameters then and say what the mean scatterer size is and what the concentrate or the, the density. But that's a lot of hand waving, a lot of approximation, because you don't know what the actual scatterers are. You don't know their Q scats. You don't so that's about as far as people go. It is very clear that in the near infrared, the wavelength dependence is fairly flat and resembles me like scattering. But that's a, I think about as far as I will go with that. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Yes. And also, of course, you, you're looking at the two-dimensional, you know, mapping. So you, you, you show this line uh, pairs, which is showing in 1D, and how do you make sure it is, uh, you know, projecting all three, uh, two-dimensional as well? I mean, it's just, I mean, you must have you're gonna have to problems. You'll have to come to my second lecture. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, to answer the first question, um, for those of you who are experimentalists, you know, the answer to this is that we spend about 90% of our time on calibration and then, you know, 10%, sometimes 95%, and then we get to discover some things if we're good at calibrating. So we calibrate. So we use a tissue phantom, and it has known optical properties, and we make its measurements at the same distance from our source and detector, so they're fixed. So we make our measurements on the phantom at about the same distance as we make our measurements on the actual system. Now we also, because there's curvature to the surface, we also will calibrate on curved phantoms. And we can take the curvature 
that we, the distortion of those lines that comes from the curvature, and we can also reconstruct the topography of the surface and account for those topographic fluctuations um, in our calculation of mu sub a. And, and then in terms of the second um, question, um, what we, we basically, uh, you know, there, there are two advantages to doing spatial modulation. One is that we can calculate the absorption and scattering in our field of view, but the second is that tissue is a low-pass filter. So high frequencies don't penetrate as deeply as low frequencies. So if we take a range of frequencies and we solve an inverse scattering integral, then we can actually do tomography and slice up that tissue in depth. Now we will also change the orientation of the patterns. So we'll project orthogonal orientations. And those, um, that's state-of-the-art research. So we've described, although we have not used it yet, what we call a diffusion tensor. Um, and so that means it's kind of like, we try to do everything that the MRI community does and they get very beautiful diffusion tensor images. We're striving to do that as well, although I doubt our images will be anywhere as beautiful. But you can imagine the diffusion tensor is the, the uh, impact that structured features within the tissue have on the diffusive decay or the blurring of the light. So if you have all organized features like collagen bundles, um, if your lines are projected in the same direction as those bundles versus orthogonal to it, then you'll actually have different blurring rates. And that's, that's detectable. Thank you. I don't know if it's useful for anything yet, but it's detectable. <laughs> Good talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, when Thanks. you're using um, a time to investigate, um, when you're using time as a, as a filter, how do, you, how do you tease out whether you have index of refraction mismatches versus, versus um, your penetration depth? So all of the dispersion is coming from index of refraction mismatches. So we, we need to have those in order to get these multiple scattering events. Now, how do we account for spatial variations in index of refraction? We don't, because we're looking at events that are happening on the transport scattering length. So by definition, we're blurring everything out. So it's not like a high resolution microscopy image where let's say if you're doing a phase image, all of the contrast comes from spatial variations in refractive index. With these diffuse techniques, we're, we're essentially um, integrating many, many of those pixels. So you can imagine we are requiring blurring. I if you think of a CCD camera, um, it's the equivalent of binning many, many pixels together. And so we bin all those pixels. Within each pixel, there hopefully are discontinuities in refractive index. Otherwise, there wouldn't be all these multiple scattering events. So we're throwing away all the coherent information content, and we're, we're requiring that there is multiple light scattering that induces dispersion in that pulse. Now, if you go back in time, so as I get closer and closer to the time scale of the original pulse, then all of those spatially localized events become more and more important. And there's a lot of really exciting work at that interface where there are a few scat. So coherent techniques, you don't want any scat, well, you want one scattering event because you gotta get it, the information back to your detector. But you haven't lost the, the coherent information content at that point. And then what if you have a few scattering events? Well, so you've got some phase shift that's accumulating how do you deal with that? There's a lot of exciting work at that interface trying to describe uh, the few scattering event regime or the transport regime. Um, it's much harder to describe. So I do easier stuff. We just go deep and then we just blur all of that out. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Tromberg. <laughs>